Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. This is the third video in Future Doc's UCAT training series, and this time we will be going through the quantitative reasoning section. I know that thinking about all of the equations and the tables and the graphs can feel quite intimidating, but you'd be surprised to know that the quantitative reasoning section is actually the highest scoring section in the UCAT exam. This just goes to show that with the right plan and with the right prep, you too can score really highly, even if you don't feel too confident in maths. So in this video, I'm going to be going through everything that you need to know about quantitative reasoning to help you maximize your score. And we'll also be doing some practice questions. Make sure that you stick around until the end to make sure that you don't miss our three top tips for quantitative reasoning to help you score in the highest deciles. Let's get right into it. So the first thing that you need to understand about the quantitative reasoning section is that it is not a pure maths exam. Instead, it is a problem-solving section that uses numbers and mathematical equations to solve questions that present information in a number of different ways, including graphs, tables, charts, Venn diagrams, and more. This is a very important skill for doctors and dentists to have as they are constantly reviewing information and analyzing data. For example, when doing drug calculations based on a patient's weight or age, or when interpreting statistics in clinical research. As you can imagine, the consequences of miscalculating something could be fatal, and this could result in you losing your license to practice. So in quantitative reasoning, there are nine question stems, and each stem has four questions, which means that there are 36 questions in total. You will have 23 minutes to answer all of the questions in this section, which means that you'll have about 40 seconds per question. Although it may feel like you have a bit more time than in the other sections, it is still very time pressured, especially considering how hard it is to do maths questions under pressure. In this section, you will be presented with graphs and tables with data that you'll be expected to interpret. You will then need to choose the correct answer out of the five options presented, and arriving at the answer might require you to make multiple calculations. Quantitative reasoning questions cover a range of numerical abilities, including percentages, ratios, unit conversions, and averages. Percentages include calculating the portion of a whole as a hundredth. For example, if you are given data on sales growth over a year, you might be asked to calculate the percentage increase in sales from the beginning to the end of that year. Let's have a look at an example. The table shows the total tax paid in dollars on annual taxable income. For example, a person with an annual taxable income of $60,000 will pay $4,990 plus 25% of $60,000 minus $36,250. Omar has a taxable income of $36,250 per year. What percentage correct to one decimal place of his taxable income does Omar pay in tax? A, 11.3%, B, 12.5%, C, 13.8%, D, 15%, or E, 16%. Feel free to pause the video here and try to work out the answer. The answer to this question is option C, 13.8%. Let's have a look at why. The second row of the table explains that the total tax paid at the top of this taxable income bracket is $4,990. Omar's taxable income of $36,250 is at the top of this income bracket. $4,990 as a percentage of Omar's taxable income is $4,990 divided by 36,250 times by 100, which gives you 13.8% correct to one decimal place. The best way to tackle maths questions is to read the question first and then look at any data that you are presented with. Scan the data to identify the key information, do any calculations that you might need to do, and then choose the correct option. Now, moving on to averages. This involves calculating the central value out of a set of numbers. Quantitative reasoning questions may ask you to calculate the average income of an individual, the average temperature in a city, or just compare averages from different data sets. 
Let's have a look at another example. The table shows the mean, maximum and minimum temperatures in a city every month for five months. The maximum temperature in June is greater than 18 degrees. What is the median of the maximum temperatures if the maximum temperature in June is also included? Is it A, 8 degrees, B, 9 degrees, C, 10 degrees, D, 11 degrees or E, 12 degrees? Again, you can pause the video here and try to answer the question yourself. The correct option is C, 10 degrees. This is because the median of the five maximum temperatures is eight degrees. If a sixth value is added and it's greater than 18 degrees, then the median is eight plus 12 divided by two, which is 10 degrees. So another key area that is assessed in quantitative reasoning is ratios. Ratios are the relationship between two or more quantities showing how many times one value contains or is contained by the other. This could involve solving problems that ask you to compare quantities directly, adjust mixtures based on given ratios, or divide quantities into parts proportional to a ratio. Let's take a look at a ratio example. The table shows the total cost of renting different types of motorboats for a certain number of hours. The total cost is calculated using the deposit and the cost of renting per hour. Some information is missing in the table. The total cost of renting a Type E motorboat is £240 for one hour. Type C and Type E motorboats have the same deposit. What is the ratio of the cost per hour of a Type C motorboat to that of a Type E motorboat? Is it A, 1 to 3, B, 15 to 28, C, 14 to 23, D, 5 to 7, or E, 23 to 27? Take some time here to try and calculate it yourself. The correct option here is B, 15 to 28. This is because the deposit for type E is the same as the deposit for type C, which would be £100. So the cost per hour of a type E motorboat is £140, giving you a ratio of 75 to 140, which equals 15 to 28. Moving on, unit conversions require you to change a quantity expressed in one unit to another unit of the same dimension. This ability is crucial for quantitative reasoning questions that involve measurements in different systems or different scales. You may need to convert distances, weights, volumes, or temperatures to a different unit to solve a problem. For this type of question, you must be careful to not get confused by unit changes. A question could initially provide measurements in centimeters but then require the answer to be given in millimeters. Let's have a look at an example. The table shows the temperature in degrees on the surface of each of six planets. The rule for changing a temperature in degrees Celsius to a temperature in degrees Fahrenheit is temperature in Fahrenheit equals temperature in degrees multiplied by 1.8 then add 32. How much higher is the temperature in Fahrenheit on Earth than the temperature in Fahrenheit on Mars? Is it A, 68 Fahrenheit, B, 72 Fahrenheit, C, 104 Fahrenheit, D, 144 Fahrenheit, or E, 176 Fahrenheit? Take some time to try to figure this out yourself. The correct response is D. 144 Fahrenheit. This is because for Earth, it's 20 times 1.8 plus 32, which gives you 68. On Mars, it's minus 60 times 1.8 plus 32, which gives you minus 76. Minus 76 minus 68 gives you minus 144. Now that we have gone through some of the most common questions that you'll get in the quantitative reasoning section, here are three top tips that will help you score as highly as possible in this section. Number one is to be economical with your calculations. Try to figure out whether you actually need to do a calculation or whether you can solve something with logic alone. You may be presented with a question that looks really complex and you might think that there are loads of calculations to do, but actually on closer inspection, you'll realize that you could actually figure it out without having to do any calculations at all. 
if you can avoid doing many calculations and use logic alone to eliminate one, two, or even three of the answers provided, this can make it much easier or give you a much higher chance of choosing a correct answer, especially if you are guessing and you are running out of time. Tip number two is to use the calculator sparingly. You want to avoid using the calculator as much as possible, but when you do use the calculator, make sure that you are using it efficiently. Make sure that you use the keyboard shortcut out plus C to make the calculator appear on the screen and practice using the keypad instead of the mouse to do all of your calculations as this can save you a lot of time. Tip number three is to be ruthless with your time. The quantitative reasoning section purposely has questions that are designed to be impossible questions that are there to slow you down and waste your time. Remember, if you answer with 100% accuracy, but only get through 70% of the test, then you won't score as highly as if you got through the entire test with 80% accuracy. So make sure that you are on the lookout for these impossible questions and don't be shy to make a guess, flag, skip the question and move on. There is no negative marking, which means that you won't lose a mark if you get the question wrong. And you may also have some time at the end to come back and review that question. So that was an overview of the quantitative reasoning section of the UCAT exam. Most students agree that the most challenging part of this section is the limited time that you have to answer each question. It is really easy to panic if you can't get the answer straight away or if you feel like you're running out of time. This can throw you off your game for the rest of the section or even for the rest of the UCAT exam. But as long as you remain calm and remember what we've spoken about in this video, then you should be fine. And remember that if you need any more support with your UCAT preparation or any other part of the application process, then check out the FutureDoc program to see how we can help you. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel and like this video if you found it useful. And I will see you next time where we will be going through the decision-making section of the UCAT exam. I'll see you then.